All right. Dear Lord, uh, I thank you for this opportunity that we can meet together on Zoom. I thank you that we can continue to study uh, your word uh, virtually um, in the pandemic. I pray that uh, as we go about our studies tonight or this morning, uh, that uh, we would, um, you'd open our eyes to see what you've taught us in your word regarding a subject that is uh, somewhat difficult um, and complicated. Um, but uh, we thank you for the fact that you do sovereignly control all things and that nothing can stand in your way. Um, and that we also uh, have freedom and we're responsible for what we do. Uh, we pray that you'd give us clarity of mind as we study the scriptures here and, uh, and that we would always remain subservient to what you have revealed in your word. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, unfortunately, I was not able to attend last week, uh, but the last series we've been going through has uh, been uh, on predestination in general, right? Chosen by God uh, regarding uh, God determining our eternal destiny um, for both who's saved and, and who's not. And Sproul did a very nice job, and, and Dan led us through a nice uh, discussion of all that. And I want to now... Um, turn uh, the conversation slightly here in terms of uh, what we're talking about God determining in advance. Previously, we were talking about God determining eternal destiny in advance. Um, I'd like to now shift the conversation for this series to uh, God's providence, um, God sovereignly controlling and determining all things that happen in creation from the largest events to the very smallest ones of them. And what relationship does that have to um, us as, as moral agents, um, in terms of having free will, and in terms of us being responsible for what we do. And so uh, this is generally what we're going to be looking at over the next five weeks. Um, and uh, because we do have five weeks on this topic, I'm going to be going a little bit more in depth than um, I might otherwise would, but that's great because then we can, uh, we can learn a little bit more in detail here. So uh, with each one of these classes, I'm always going to start um, with a cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes because I really like Calvin and Hobbes. And some of these are really um, relevant here. So, you know, Calvin here says, you know, I've decided to be a fatalist, right? All events are preordained and unalterable. Whatever will be, will be. That way, if anything bad happens, it's not my fault, it's fate. And then, you know, Hobbes trips Calvin, says too bad you were fated to do that. And Calvin's like, that wasn't fate. Right, and so you know, here we have a clear expression of you know how did how did these uh, concepts of well fate and predestination and, and determination and that sort of thing all work together with our with our um, uh, free will and responsibility. And for those of you who've maybe watched uh, the movie Minority Report, uh, you can see how this is a uh, you know a direct you know application understanding of of, of this idea here. So for those of you who haven't seen it. Tom Cruise stars in it, and uh, it basically there's this group called pre-crime uh, where they have these uh, precogs. These are these uh, um, people sleeping basically uh, down here, and they can foresee into the future murders that are going to happen. And basically, what uh, Tom Cruise, who plays John Anderton, the chief of pre-crime, pre-crime, and all of his agents do is they go out and they uh, arrest the people before they commit the murders, and then they put them in jail. Um, and so they're basically, in some sense, responsible for what they didn't actually do. And so that brings up this question that, like, if, some, if the precogs foreknow what's going to happen, is it, is it actually determined to be happening? Um, so it brings up this interesting question. And as, as an aside, for those of you who watched the movie closely, uh, that there's a Department of Justice agent named Danny Whitwer. And uh, he says that he went to Fuller Theological Seminary. So I don't know if they threw in that because they're like all pre the Presbyterians are all predestinationists. So we have to have this, uh, this agent go to Fuller Theological Seminary. But that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. So, so, so we, we come across this concept in, in a variety of ways. And I'm sure some of you have thought about it at different times. And ultimately, we like to know, like, what does is, what is the uh, Bible teach about this? Uh, and so if we first go to the you know, Westminster Confession of Faith, um, chapter three, section one, it tells us that from all eternity and by the completely wise and holy purpose of his own will, God has freely and unchangeably ordained whatever happens. Now, this ordainment does not mean that God is the author of sin or that he represses the will of his created beings or that he takes away the freedom or contingency of secondary causes. 
Rather, the will of created beings and the freedom and contingency of secondary causes are established by him. And so uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, functions as a, you know, a secondary authority and in our church, always subservient to scripture. And, but I'm ultimately this, uh, in today's class, going to want to go back to what scripture teaches about that and understand why the, uh, those who formed the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, said what they did here. Um, so in terms of the outline of the class over the next five um, sessions, we're basically going to be going uh, in the following way. Today, I am just going to be presenting what the problem is. What does the Bible teach about God's sovereignty? What does he teach about free will and human responsibility? And kind of try to put a detailed formulation of how, like, these things seem somewhat contradictory. How do these work together? Um, and so you're going to have to wait and then until next week for before we start getting into analyzing and understanding uh, how these work together. Um, and the third week then, I'm going to be showing that those who have objections who think that these are somewhat contradictory are either committing a logical fallacy or are implicitly importing non-Christian or unbiblical assumptions about the nature of God and the nature of humanity. Uh, and then the fourth Sunday, we'll, we're going to cover some further questions that are more applicable to our everyday lives. We're going to be taking some of these concepts that we've gone through and applying them to specific questions and ultimately maybe tying this back to somewhat of what Sproul has talked, teached us in uh, about predestination. Um, and if we have, if time allows, um, I'd like to maybe get into looking at God's foreknowledge and human freedom, but I'm not quite sure if we'll be able to get there. Um, so for today's class, uh, the outline is going to be as follows. I'm first going to be talk, looking at like what does the Bible teach about God's sovereignty? What does it teach about free will? And then go through a few biblical examples illustrating God's sovereignty and human responsibility and free will working together. And, and then uh, put together in, like, in the last minute or so a detailed formulation of, of this problem or this alleged contradiction between these two things. And so the purpose of today's class is in a sense, I'd like to just start and sit in scripture and understand and have a deep appreciation and understanding for what scripture teaches about these two, about these topics. Um, we're ultimately going to be using the tools that God's given us in terms of reason and philosophy and logic to the further flesh out and understand and apply what the scripture teaches. But we first should always be subservient and understand what God has revealed to us in his word, um, and then go from there in terms of understanding uh, how it applies to our life, how it all fits together, and that sort of thing. So to start, I want to look at, you know, what does the Bible teach about God's sovereignty? Now, there are a few points I want to make about this. First, you know, is maybe a little bit redundant here. God sovereignly controls everything. So if we look at Ephesians 1.11, great verse that illustrates this. You know, it says, you know, uh, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Um, everything from the smallest to the greatest. And uh, in Philippians 3.21, it reiterates this. It says that God, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. Um, Hebrews 1.3, you know, again, reiterates this, that uh, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And Colossians 1.17 says that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And so here we see that God sovereignly controls everything, not in a deistic way, in which he just winds up a clock and sets steps back and watches it run, but he's actively involved in everything that happens on the earth, right? He sustains all things by his powerful word. In him, all things hold together. And um, so he's actively involved in working in his creation, which is very distinct from a deistic understanding of the world. Um, so firstly, we can see that God sovereignly controls everything. Secondly, we can see that God rules over everything, right? Just like a king rules over his kingdom. Now, this is a major theme in the book of Daniel. Uh, if you remember, we have King Nebuchadnezzar, who was not willing to acknowledge that God rules over everything. And instead, you know, he was saying, no, look at me, look at everything that I've done. Uh, and so uh, this, this theme uh, comes, comes about here in Daniel 4 and 5 and so forth, where it says that, um, th so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. And in Daniel 4, it says, um, 
you know, this is in response, or this is basically predicting what, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be, uh, he's going to afflict Nebuchadnezzar with all of this, um, with insanity, basically, because he was not acknowledging that God was sovereign. And he says, seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives to them anyone he wishes. Um, and then again, in Daniel 5 here, it says, you know, that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. And uh, this last reference here in Daniel 5 is actually to King, is, is in the context of King Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, uh, who made the same mistake as Nebuchadnezzar. And, and God ended up writing this inscription on the wall and, and killing uh, Belshazzar later that night um, because he, he would not acknowledge that God rules over everything and is sovereign over everything. So we've seen two points, or oh yeah, I forgot. There's a, there's a couple more things here I wanted to mention. Uh, in First Chronicles here, right? So this is a prayer of David that he had um, when he was trying to gather all the resources and all the money to build Solomon's temple. And he gives a prayer of, of giving and thanksgiving and uh, to God in the context of this tithing. And he says that wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. And, and then again, in Second Chronicles here, this is again another prayer, but by King Jehoshaphat over Judah. And this is in the context of the Moabites and the Ammonites surrounding Judah. Um, and, and he's uh, praying, to, praying to the Lord. And he's saying, you know, you rule over all kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. And after he prayed this, God basically had the Moabites and the Ammonites kill each other. And the Israelites didn't have to bother doing anything in terms of fighting them. Uh, so, uh, and, and then in Psalm 22, it says, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And, and in Psalm 47, it says, God reigns over the nations. He's seated on his holy throne. So we can see this is a theme throughout scripture, that God rules over everything. And Jeremiah 31 tells us that he, uh, God appoints the sun to shine by day. He decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night. He stirs up the seas so that its waves roar. So God controls and, and is, rules over all the natural processes on earth. Um, and in Isaiah 45, it, God explicitly tells us that he forms the light and creates darkness. He brings prosperity and creates disaster. The Lord does all these things. So you can see here that God rules over everything is a very important theme that runs throughout scripture. Now, thirdly, I'd like to point out here that the Bible teaches that God accomplishes what he pleases. Now, you know, so Psalm 115 tells us that our God in his heaven, he does whatever pleases him. You know, Psalm 135 then reiterates this and says, the Lord does whatever pleases him in both the heavens and on the earth and the seas and in all their depths. In Job 23, you know, Job is, is talking in, 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 in his uh, suffering and he says, you know, who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. Uh, and then in Daniel 4, um, back to this theme of sovereignty, Right, King Nebuchadnezzar is now praising God after his sanity has been restored, after he had been uh, been wandering like an animal for a few years. He says that he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? And then in Isaiah 46, the Lord says that my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So here we can easily see, we can see again that another theme is throughout scripture is that God does whatever he wants. But this doesn't necessarily mean that he just does things arbitrarily or whimsically, right? God always does what is consistent with his own character and his character isn't changing. So what he does is not arbitrary. And he also always has good reasons for what he does. So what he does is not whimsical either. So God always accomplishes what he pleases and he always does what he wants. Fourthly, the Bible teaches that God ensures that his purpose and plans are brought about. Um, in Isaiah 14, you know, the Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. And, and I, again, in that chapter, you know, he says that this is the plan determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? And then later on in Isaiah 25, um, it says that, you know, God, you have done wonderful things, things planned from long ago. He, God does what he plans. 
And then in Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings, we have the exact same wording of this verse. You know, have you not heard long ago I ordained it? In days of old I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you have turned four to five cities into piles of stone. And this is God here speaking, responding to King Hezekiah's prayer for, for help after Sennacherib of Assyria had surrounded Judah and, and threatened to destroy it. And here God's saying is that God ordains whatever Assyria did and, and when they turned fortified cities into piles of stone. And so here we see that, you know, God's plans cannot be frustrated. They always come about the way that he plans, the way that he purposes. And ultimately, this is extremely comforting, right? Because we know that nothing can get in the way of what our good God wants to accomplish. And so there's nothing to be afraid of if we put our full trust in him. Um, this is still repeated, you know, throughout other verses here. In Isaiah 46, you know, God says that he makes known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. He says, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. So even the smallest things like the birds of prey or people from the farthest lands of the earth, um, God accomplishes what his purpose and plans uh, uh, are. He brings them about. And Isaiah 55, this is maybe a familiar verse to many of you, right? He says, so my, it's my word that goes out from my mouth. It will, run not, it will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve for the purpose to which I sent it. God's word accomplishes what he, what he intends for it to do. I know sometimes we can often think of God's word as just something that passively sits there or that we just passively read, but ultimately God's word is what reads us and it changes us. It's active, right? Hebrews 4, 12 says that for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. And so here we can see that, you know, God's word accomplishes what he intends it to. Um, and we should be cognizant of that when we read scripture that Ultimately, when we read scripture, scripture should be reading us and should be changing the way that we think and act in the world. And then here in Lamentations 2, you know, it says the Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. And this is referring to God fulfilling his word against Jerusalem and letting the nations overthrow her. But you can see it was planned long ago, and he fulfilled what he had planned long ago. And then lastly, in Ezekiel 12, it's on, God says, I, the Lord, will speak what I will, and it shall be fulfilled without delay. Uh, for in your days, you rebellious people, I will fulfill whatever I say, declares the sovereign Lord. So God fulfills what he says. If he says it, it will come about. He ensures that his purpose and plans are brought about. So then fifthly, I wanted to uh, say that, you know, what does the Bible teach about God's sovereignty? God works to ensure that everything happens according to his purpose and will. So if we go back to this uh, verse in Ephesians 1.11 and look at the, uh, this, it says, you know, in him we're also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything. There's nothing that happens outside the will and plan and purpose of, of God. So every, this includes everything. Sixthly, the, the Bible teaches that God has determined the end from the beginning. I don't think this can be more clearly stated except right here in Isaiah 46, where God says, I make known the end from the beginning. Uh, other more literal translations say that God declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. He says, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please, right? His purpose will stand. What God declares is unchangeable. It will happen. It's determined. It's going to happen. So God has determined the end from the beginning. Seventhly, the Bible teaches that whatever God determines in advance must happen. We can see this in a variety of places, right? First of all, in Daniel 11, right? <clears throat> you know, it says the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. Right? What has been determined must take place. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about what God has determined in advance. What he's proclaimed will certainly come to pass. It must happen. This is reiterated again in 1 Kings 13, where it says, The message declared by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. It will certainly come true. There's no probability about it. It's going to happen. And in Habakkuk 2, 3, it says, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. 
Though it linger, wait for it, and it will certainly come and will not delay. It will not prove false. It will certainly come. It's going to happen. And again, in Hosea 5, he says that, you know, amongst the, among the tribes of Israel, I proclaim what is certain, right? Prophesying about what's going to be happening to Ephraim. It's going, it's certain. Whatever God determines in advance must happen. There's no probability about it. Eighthly, we've been talking in some sense about uh, the general idea of God determining things in advance and at a broad scope and that sort of thing. But it's all the way down to the very smallest of things. God determines in advance every single decision and action people make. All right. So God in Psalm 139, 16, I mean, this is very clearly it states, you know, your eye saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. Be before we even lived one day of our life. Every single day of our life has been ordained in and was written in his book, and pointing to the uh unchangeableness, the determinedness of this in advance. And it says in Job 14, Job says, a person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. And in Acts 17, right, when Paul is presenting the gospel and defending the faith in Athens at the Areopagus, right, he says, from one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. He marked out their appointed times in history. He and in Ephesians 2, right, he tells us that uh, we are created in God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then lastly, in Lamentations 3, right, he says that who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it, right? So God has not only determined how long we will live, what time period we will live in, and where we will live, but he has also determined every day of our lives in advance, as well as everything that we plan to do, as it says here in Lamentations 3. So down to the very details of our lives, God determines in advance every single decision and action people make. And so lastly, that promise, this is the last point about God's sovereignty in terms of what the Bible teaches. God sovereignly controls and determines every minute detail. We got into this a little bit in the previous point, but uh, this is clearly expressed by Jesus in Matthew. Right? He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And this was repeated again in Luke 12. He says, even indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Right? And this is in the context of Jesus sending out his 12 disciples, basically telling them, encouraging them that, you know, he so sovereignly controls everything all the way down to the very smallest of detail that they don't have to worry when they're facing um, and problems and trials and that sort of thing. God is in complete control. And if you think about this, this is this is quite amazing. You know, think about combing your hair this morning, um, or in, in brushing your hair. That God is control even over how many hairs fall out of your head this morning. He's, he determines everything, and He determines it all the way down to the cast of the dice in Las Vegas. Proverbs 16 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Even the things that we think are extremely random that we can't really predict, God is in control and determines even those things. So from the largest of things to the smallest of them, God sovereignly controls and determines everything in advance from the minute detail to the very greatest of things. So here we can see nine things that the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty. He controls everything. He rules over everything. He accomplishes what he pleases. He ensures that his purpose and plans are brought about, and he works to ensure everything happens according to the, his purpose and will. And uh, God has determined the end from the beginning. Whatever he determines in advance must happen. And God determines in advance both every single decision and action people make, as well as every minute detail. And so this is a theme that's thought, taught throughout scripture. I've only given a, a brief survey. We could go through so many other portions of scripture that illustrate this. Um, but I did want to take some time to do that because I know sometimes people can think that, you know, this is just some you know, fluke thing that uh, some Christians think that God determines everything in advance. And the reason we think so is because it, this, is, this is clearly taught throughout scripture. Now, this, that's what the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty, but the Bible also teaches very strong things about free will and our responsibility and how we're responsible for what we do. And so I'd like to go make a few points about what the Bible teaches about free will. Now, firstly, I'd like to point out that people, the Bible teaches that people freely do what they wish. They do what they want to do. Um, in Genesis 6-2, right? So, uh, this is 
this is uh, before before the flood, uh, and it says here that the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. They chose whoever they wanted to, and they married them, right? In Esther 9, right, this is the context of, if you remember the story of Esther, um, Haman issued an edict to basically say that the Jews could be, be killed, and then, um, and then because of Esther's intervention, this was um, somewhat reversed, and there's also a law passed that the, the Jews could then defend themselves against their enemies. And so this is the con in the context of that, uh, where the Jews defended themselves against, against their enemies. And it says, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. They did what they pleased. They did what they wanted to do. They had freedom. They had free will in, in, their, in what they did. In Matthew 17, um, Jesus is speaking here. He says that, but I tell you, Elijah has come and they did not recognize him. They have done everything that they wished, right? Now here, Elijah is referring to, he's referring to John the Baptist in this case. Um, but here again, he says that they've done to him everything they wished. And this is repeated again in Mark 9. It says they have done to him everything that they wished. Uh, and so here it suggests that, you know, people can do, people do what they freely wish to do. But they do what they want to do. Um, in Judges 17, if you remember, uh, this is a theme throughout Judges that Israel had no king, uh, both in terms of an earthly king, and they didn't follow their heavenly king, and they just did what was right in their own eyes. And so this is repeated in both Judges and Deuteronomy, where it says that in those days, Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit, you know, and we're not, they're not to do everyone doing as they see fit. Uh, people, people do what they freely wish to do, they do what they want to do. Um, uh, the Deuteronomy passage comes in the context of Moses giving instructions to Israel, uh, but, the, but, the same, but the same principle here applies. Um, in Isaiah 66, it sums this up saying that people have chosen their own ways and they delight in their abominations. So people choose what they want to do. They freely do what they want to do. Uh, so first of all, yeah, people freely do what they wish to do. Um, secondly, I'd like to point out the Bible teaches that people do whatever they like. Um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, kind of go through this quickly here, but there's a, there's a, a, a phrase that, that appears throughout scripture saying that, you know, do with her whatever you think best or do, do whatever you wish to do. Um, here in the context of Genesis, right, this is with Abraham, Abram after um, he had tried to have a, his son Ishmael with, with Haggai or with Hagar and uh, Sarai got mad about it. And so Abram said, do with her whatever you think, whatever you think best. You know, she had a choice in the matter. She, she could do what she wanted. And so this is a repeated theme throughout all the narrative portions of scripture. And right? it says, you know, do to us whatever seems good and right to you. Um, you do whatever you wish, uh, whatever you like, um, whatever seems best to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through this, but you can see that there, there's numerous places here that we can do wh whatever we wish to do, whatever we want to do, whatever we think best. Um, yeah, so let, let's just, uh, let's skip through this. Uh, and so second, and thirdly, um, so, so that, that is a theme, people do whatever they like is a theme that's found throughout scripture, but people also can do whatever they want. Um, that second point, I was looking at a bunch of verses in the narrative portions of scripture where people were telling each other, do what you wish, do what you like, but also in the law in Deuteronomy, it always, um, repeats over and over that, you know, you may slaughter your animals in any of your towns and eat as much of the meat as you want. Um, throughout of all of these laws, there's, there's things that people say that you can, you can take as much as much, as much as you like. Uh, you can do it, eat of it as much as you want, eat as much as you like. And so people in some sense can, can do whatever they want. You can do whatever they, they want to buy. Again, I'll skip through some of this, but it's, it's another theme that's found throughout, uh, throughout the, the law of Deuteronomy. Um, and, and, and then even in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says that uh, in the context of um, a, a woman who's, uh, whose husband dies, that she's then free to marry anyone she wishes. She can choose whoever she'd like to marry, uh, as long as he belongs to the Lord. So people freely do what they wish. They do whatever they like. They do whatever they want. Um, fourthly, I'd like to point out here that people have options from which to choose. The Bible teaches that people have options from which to choose. If you remember in the context of David here, um, David gave a census that the Lord did not, uh, did not condone. It was, it was, he was not supposed to give this census. And so because he gave the census, God responded and, and told David, you know, I'm going to punish you. And he says, and uh, he used his, uh, David's seer Gad and, and Gad came and told David says, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to give you three options. 
choose one of them for me to carry out against you. Right? So Gad went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says, take your choice. And he gave him three choices, either three years of famine, three months of being swept away from his, before his enemies, um, or three days of the sword of the Lord uh, with plague in the land. And it says, now then decide how I should answer the one who sent me. Right? And so it, it assumes here that David has, David has a choice. He can choose what, what he, which, which punishment uh, that he'd like. This is again repeated in, in 2 Samuel. I won't go over this because it's the same exact thing. Um, but we also see this in Joshua 24, right? Joshua is instructing the Israelites, and he says that if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Um, but he says, it, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Uh, so Joshua decides to serve the Lord. He says, you can choose. You can choose. Uh, you have options from which to choose. And uh, again, in Deuteronomy 30, as Moses instructs the Israelites, right? He says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, right? He says, choose life that you may, you and your children may live. We have the option between life and death, and they should choose life. And in 1 Kings 18, when Elijah is on Mount Carmel, addressing the Israelites right before the prophets of Baal, um, and Elijah set up, you know, their different offerings to see if, who could have them consumed by fire to see who's actually God. He went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So here we can see that people have options from which to choose. Um, fifthly, I'd like to point out that people are not forced or compelled to do what they do. The Bible teaches that people are not forced to do what they do. Right in First Corinthians seven thirty seven, Paul is you know talking in the context of marriage here, but he says that the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, right, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. And so you know he he, he shows that this is possible for you not to be under compulsion. Um, and and then again in Second Corinthians, Paul says that each of you right should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. You should do it out of your own goodness and generosity and free will. You're not forced or compelled to do what you do. And then in Philemon, you know, one of those uh, shorter books in scripture that's only one chapter, uh, Paul is Paul's writing to Philemon and uh, he's referring to, he's talking about him wanting to keep uh, Onesimus to help him while he's in chains rather than sending him back to Philemon to help him. But Paul says, you know, I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary, uh, right? So he says that people, people are not forced to do what they do. And again, here in 1 Peter 5, right? Uh, Peter says that you know, we should be shepherds of God's flock. Uh, that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, not because you're forced to, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Um, and then lastly, here in Esther 1.8, in the context of King Xerxes' banquets, right, he says that there's no compulsion with respect to how much people are allowed to drink. Each can uh, drink as much as each man desired. And so here we see, again, throughout scripture that teaches that people are not forced or compelled to do what they do. They do what they want to do. They free really do what they wish to do. Um, and then uh, the sixth point here I'd like to point out is, is that we have control over our own wills. Uh, we go back to that 1 Corinthians 7.37 passage, and Paul is saying that, you know, uh, in, in terms of Paul's instructions about marriage, in terms of whether you're deciding you'd like to get married or not, you know, he, he says that if the person has control over his own will and has decided not to marry the virgin, that person also does the right thing, right? He, he should, he, assumes that, you know, people can have control over their own wills. They do what they want to do. And then lastly, and seventhly, I'd like to point out here that God holds us responsible for our actions. He, the scripture is very clear in teaching that God will hold us responsible for our actions uh, because we do what we want to do. And, and this is, uh, these verses are really a wake-up call to me um, because we live our, our everyday lives because they teach that, you know, we're going to have to give an account to the Lord of the universe for everything that we have done in our lives, from, from the smallest to the greatest thing, from the worst and ugliest thing to the best, and God is going to judge us accordingly. Um, in Revelation 20, right, when it, when it depicts this, he says that, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And in Matthew 12, 36, you know, it's, he's, 
It says that, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. And again, repeated here in Romans 3, it says that um, the whole world will be held accountable by God. Um, and then in Romans 14, right, each of us will have to give an account of ourselves to God. So these are good things to remember um, as we go about our everyday lives, remembering that, you know, everything that we're, we do, we're going to have to give account to God. We're responsible for what we do. We're responsible for our actions. Um, and this is, again, repeated in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And then in 1 Peter 4, he says that they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And in Hebrews 4.13, it says that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we give, must give account. So we're going to have to give an account to God someday. He's going to hold us responsible for what we do. Um, and so uh, we, we are responsible for our actions. Uh, you know, God will bring judgment both the, both the righteous and the wicked for every activity he's going to judge every deed right he's going to bring into deed every judgment including every hidden thing right? even the things that no one knows about he's going to he sees what you do and we're going to be held responsible so these are the seven things that i claim that the bible teaches about free will people freely do whatever they wish they do whatever they like they do whatever they want to do we have options from which to choose. We're not forced or compelled to do what we do. We have control of our own wills. And we're, we're ultimately, because of this, God's going to hold us responsible for our actions. He's going to hold us accountable, right? And so uh, now that we've surveyed what the Bible has to teach about God's sovereignty and about free will and, and have a deeper understanding of each one of these things, I wanted to go through a couple specific examples um, illustrating both God's sovereignty and human responsibility in terms of uh, how they work together. Now, first of all, you know, one of the clearest expressions of this is the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross, right? Uh, the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross here, God had determined in advance that this would take place. He had determined in advance that Jesus would be nailed to the cross. Um, and it's, this is clearly expressed in Acts 2, where it says, this is where Peter is addressing the crowd at Pentecost. And he says that this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Uh, so the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross, this is determined by advance by God. This was God's deliberate plan. He not only foreknew it, but it was also part of his, de his deliberate plan. And then this is repeated again in Acts 4 where this is in the context of Peter and John praying, right? After they had just um, gone to the Sanhedrin and the, and the Sanhedrin had rebuked them for speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus, right? And they say that indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And they said that they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen, right? So the fact... <laughs> The soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross and Herod and Pontius Pilate did what God had decided beforehand should happen. And in Luke 22, Jesus is speaking here at the Last Supper, and he's referring to Judas's uh, betrayal. He says that the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, as it has been decreed. And so here we see that, you know, the, the events surrounding Jesus's death on the cross were determined in advance that they would take place. Um, and if you look at Isaiah, you know, the, the famous suffering servant text in Isaiah 52 and 53, uh, some of it appears in Handel's Messiah, if you ever listen to that. Uh, but that speaks specifically to this as well as prophesied in advance. If you look at one verse there, Isaiah 53, 10, it says, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And this is again repeated in Daniel 9, where it says the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. So not only was this prophesied in advance and determined in advance, we're told in Acts and in Luke that, you know, God had decreed beforehand that this should all happen. So it was determined in advance that the soldiers would nail, nail Jesus to the cross. But at the same time, the Bible also teaches that the soldiers freely and wickedly crucified Christ and are therefore responsible for what they did. If you again look at Acts 2.23, where we just told us that if there's this God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, in the second part of that verse, it says, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. It says that the men did it wickedly. Uh, in a more literal translation, it says by the hands of lawless men. And this is how we know that they freely did it because it said that they did it wickedly. Um, again, this is the context of Peter addressing the crowd at Pentecost. And so the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross, their actions were determined in advance. 
but they freely did what they wanted to do. And they wickedly did what they wanted to do. And therefore they're gonna be held responsible. The second example I'd like to point out here is Pharaoh hardening his heart and not letting the Israelites go, right? Um, so this is an event that the Bible says God raised up Pharaoh in accordance with his purposes. You remember God accomplishes all of his purposes and plans. Uh, in Exodus 9 and in Romans um, 9, it says that, uh, you know, God raised up Pharaoh for this very purpose, that he might show his power and that his name will be proclaimed in all the earth. So here we see that the events surrounding Pharaoh was uh, part of the plan and purpose of God. And, but it says that God determined in advance that he would harden Pharaoh's heart, right? This is a theme found throughout many verses in Exodus here. It tells us that, uh, you know, he says, God says, I will harden his heart that he will not let the people go, right? He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, right? The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. You know, and then again, I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials. And again, in Exodus 10, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is repeated over and over and over again, right? The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Um, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So um, God determined in advance that, that Pharaoh's heart was going to be hardened. Uh, but uh, he also hardened Pharaoh's heart. But then it also says in scripture that Pharaoh freely did as he wished because he hardened his own heart. Um, so uh, some of these just say, for example, Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them. You might say, well, yeah, it became hard because God hardened it, which is true. But if you look specifically here at Exodus 8, 15, right, um, and says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron. And again, here in Exodus 8, 32, at the bottom there, it says, but this time Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. And again, if we look here at... Um, Exodus 9, 34 and 35, it says that when Pharaoh saw the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard and would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. So uh, both God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh freely did as he wished by hardening his own heart. And this is all in uh, concert with what God's purpose and plans were as it says in Exodus and Romans. So here we have another example where God determined something in advance, but um, the, what he had determined in advance was also free. Uh, thirdly, the third example I'd like to point out here is that is Peter denying Jesus three times, right? God determined in advance that this was going to take place. This is repeated throughout all four gospels. Jesus tells Peter that this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Um, and this then is carried out where Peter then willingly and freely denies Jesus three times. Um, we're not going to go through the passage here, but again, it's recorded in all four Gospels that he willingly and freely denies three, Jesus three times. But then Jesus holds Peter responsible for what he did, right? First of all, actually in Luke 22, it says that Jesus looks straight at Peter right after he finished denying him three times. It says, just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Uh, so first of all, the Lord looked straight at P Peter. By the way, as an aside, um, next time I sin or you sin, think about God looking you straight in the eye immediately after you've sinned and rebelled against him. Um, and, and that's a really big, at least disincentive for me uh, to sin. But anyway, it, he looked him in the eye he held him for responsible for what he did. But then again, in, in John 21, at the end of John, right, Jesus asked Simon, he says, do you love me? And he asked him three times here uh, when he's reinstating Peter. Peter. Uh, he wouldn't have to reinstate Peter if he wasn't holding him for responsible for what he did, right? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? So Peter willingly and freely denied Jesus three times. God held him responsible for that, but he also determined in advance that Peter would deny him three times. And then the last example I wanted to point out here is Cyrus releasing the Jews from captivity. Uh, if you remember King Cyrus, Isaiah prophesied that uh, in, this would take place, this would be determined in advance that he released the Jews from captivity. And Isaiah 44, right, he says, he who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will save Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So he's prophesying that Cyrus will say, Jerusalem should be rebuilt and its foundations be laid and relayed. And, um, and this is repeated again in Isaiah 45, right? Where he says that Cyrus will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. 
but not for a price or reward, right? It's not, it's not forced or compelled. He does it willingly and he does it freely, but God has determined in advance that this will take place. Um, but then we see in scripture in both Second Chronicles and Ezra that Cyrus freely decided to let the Jews return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and put out a proclamation in writing and applied, uh, sent it out throughout the whole realm, uh, letting the Jews go back to Jerusalem. And if you look in these passages in Second Chronicles and Ezra, it says at the beginning, it says, in order that the word of the Lord would be fulfilled, Ezra did this, and he freely did it. Um, he, he issued his edict. So here again, we have an example of uh, God determining what Cyrus did in advance and Cyrus doing what he did freely. So here we have four examples, the soldiers nailing Jesus to the cross, Pharaoh hardening his heart, Peter denying Jesus three times, and Cyrus releasing the Jews from captivity as examples that illustrate both God's sovereignty and our responsibility and free will working um, together with one another. Uh, there's more examples that we could find throughout scripture here, but I just wanted to list those four. So that then brings us to uh, what I'd like to give a detailed formulation of a problem. So we've seen that you know, the Bible clearly teaches that God sovereignly controls and determines all things. The Bible clearly teaches that we have free will and are responsible for what we do. And it also provides very specific examples in which these things work together with one another. So, uh, but to us, it seems like these things can't go together. They seem somewhat contradictory. So I'd like to formulate what that seems, that, that apparent contradiction um, here. So the Bible teaches the following things, right? First of all, it teaches that God ordains everything that happens. Secondly, it teaches that, you know, to ordain something is to establish that it will take place. That's just, it's kind of the definition of what ordain is. And thirdly, the Bible teaches that people have free will and are responsible for what they do, right? So what's the problem? <clears throat> right? If God ordains everything that happens, right, then everything that happens is established and it's determined in advance. It's unchangeable. It, it, it's going to be that way. The, you, there's nothing you can, right? But if everything is determined in advance, then it seems like we wouldn't have free will. And we wouldn't be responsible for anything that we do because it seems like it's set, it's unchangeable. We can't do anything about it. Like it, it, that's just the way it's going to be. But the Bible teaches that we do have free will. So it, this seems to be somewhat contradictory, right? It seems like we have to give up one of these, one of these premises at one, two, or three. It seems that we can't have all of them be true, right? You either have to, have to, it seems like we either have to say, God ordains everything that happens and ordaining something means that it's going to take place, but but we know people don't have actually have free will, in which case we'd be denying the third premise, which the Bible clearly, clearly teaches. Or we'd have to say, you know, people have free will, and ordaining something means that it will take place, but God doesn't actually ordain everything that happens, which also is denying a premise um, one, which the Bible clearly teaches. Or it seems like we'd have to say that people have free will and God ordains everything that happens, but it's possible to ordain things that never take place, which just doesn't make sense because that's not what the definition of ordain ordain means. And again, it goes against the teaching of scripture, right? So it seems like options A, B, and C each deny one of these premises that are taught clearly in scripture. Uh, and so how are we going to resolve this problem? This seems to be an apparent contradiction. Um, and uh, and so at this point, now, now we've gone through what the Bible teaches about these things, biblical examples of this, and, and a detailed formulation of this problem. Um, and... Uh, at this point, I'm going to halt and, uh, and, and stop for now. Um, I guess maybe it's kind of like a TV episode. I'll leave you hanging. Like, how, what, what, how do these things work together? What, what's the deal? I have to come back next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I did want to spend today spending some time in Scripture and getting more of a comprehensive understanding of what the Bible teaches about these subjects, because it's only when we have that sort of comprehensive understanding can we start using uh, the tools of reason and logic and philosophy and that sort of thing to start reasoning and thinking through and clarifying these matters because um, we're always going to be subservient to what God said in his, says in his word uh, and so and so that's why I spent all the time I did in scripture I hope um, maybe, maybe some of you were a little bit bored by uh, some all, all the verses there but I promise that will that will not be the case going forward but I, I did want to spend some time in scripture um, and with that I do want to open up for any discussion or questions or comments comments people had. I maybe should have mentioned at the beginning, feel free to stop me um, in, in the middle if you need to have a comment or a question and that sort of thing. I don't want to have this just be uh, me, me preaching or talking to you the whole time. But yeah, does anyone, does anyone have any, any questions? Uh, I have a comment. Yeah. Uh, there was a pop, there were a couple of pop songs uh, when I was in high school. And one of them contained uh, the words, 
your mind is not your own. And uh, I would think back to the time when I was in second grade and I made a firm decision not to go forward and not to make a public profession of faith. And uh, I took a firm grip on the pew in front of me to strengthen my resolve. And then my legs started going forward on their own and I lost my grip on the pew and I went forward and uh, publicly professed Jesus as Lord. And mm -hmm. then this, the second uh, pop song in high school was, had the words, you've got to believe that we are magic. Nothing can stand in our way. And I thought about God and God's people and how in the end, we will be victorious. Yeah, we will ultimately be victorious, right? Nothing can get in the way of God's purpose and plans. It's very comforting to remember that. Yeah. But it seems like that uh, that uh, first comment you made was it seemed to be a little bit more on the side of saying that we don't actually have control over over what we do, right? Um, well, at that moment, I would say for that particular moment, I would say I I was not in control. Hmm. Does anybody else have any 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 questions or comments? I think you might be, yeah. Uh, I would comment on the question of the soldiers. Yeah. The army was a well-knit group of people, militarily, and they did nothing unless they were ordered to do it. So the common soldier who hammered the nail into Christ I don't understand the wickedness there. Well, just because you're ordered to do something doesn't mean you have to do it, right? In the if, military, yeah. you're sure better. Oh, yeah, there might be consequences if you retaliate, right? So, if, so pretend you lived in Nazi Germany under Hitler, right? Hitler says that you should give up all the Jews and send them to concentration camps. Most say, well, of them I, did. What? Most of the, the soldiers did. Right, but they didn't have to. They could say, no, we're not doing this. This is wicked. And and then the consequence might be they get shot or put in concentration camps themselves or something. But the point here is, is that they weren't forced to do it. They still had an option to rebel, right? They, the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross could have said, I'm not going into work today. Or they could have said, no, this man's innocent. I'm not doing this. And then they would suffer the consequences, but they didn't have to um, nail the nails into Jesus, right? I, I don't quite agree with you there. Mm. I mean, you have certainly have to say they had other options they could have done, right? They could have rebelled, right? That, that is an option they could have done, right? It's not like someone was literally there with a hand with a, with, a, with their hand forcing their hand to, uh, to to pound the nails into Jesus. Well, it's like a well. Well, you know, uh, in Vietnam, there was the My Lai Massacre where an innocent village was totally killed and totally destroyed on the orders of uh, various military people. And one, uh, I guess he was a private, I don't know what his rank was. He accidentally on purpose shot himself on, in the foot, literally shot himself in the foot. So therefore he was incapacitated and therefore he was not able to carry out the order and not subject to military discipline. And furthermore, he was not subject to uh, war crimes tribunals because he, was, he didn't carry out the massacre. Hmm. Does anyone have any other any other comments or questions? Well, I'll, I'll put in one last uh, comment. 
uh, evidence that de demands a verdict by Josh McDowell has got tons and tons of prophecies and tons and tons of fulfillment. So you might want to read that book. I'm familiar with that book. Yeah, thanks, Frank. I was just thinking of something that's uh, along the lines of what Frank described, except it wasn't a physical compulsion. Just think of any time you've done something wrong and just been washed over by a sense of shame. So you that washing over of the shame was something that came from your conscience or from God or the Holy Spirit. But that wasn't something, you know, you had the free will not to feel shame. Uh, you just, that, that shame just happens without your uh, asking it to happen. So it's not a physical action, but it's definitely an emotional response. Right. Are you, are you suggesting that emotional response is somehow not part of our freedom? Yeah, we don't have, yes, in the sense that in some ways that is uh, God speaking to us or the Holy Spirit speaking to us and guiding us in ways that we don't get to choose how we feel all the time. Right, I think I'd also point out here that in some sense well, it maybe feels like you don't have well, in, in some sense, when that guilt washes over you, the fact that, you know, you respond and you feel that way is because your character is the way it is, right? That, um, that you're someone who's, who's listening to, to, to what God well, has said to you, right? Well, people can harden their hearts, you know, become, uh, you know, over time and, and sort of blank out that feeling of shame. But that's a, that requires effort. Um, even for, I think, the most hardened of criminals, uh, well, maybe at that point, they feel no shame of anything, but for most people, that's a natural response. Right, certainly. Uh, that's certainly the case. But yeah, people do still have the ability to, to harden themselves over time if they, if they choose to do so. Right. Yeah. I guess my point being, it's not only what we do physically, but also what we think about how we feel. Those are all part of, of uh, the questions of free will and God's sovereignty. Right. That, that's absolutely the case, right? Because God not only holds us responsible for what our actions are, but he holds us responsible for our thoughts, right? He says that we should take every thought captive and we should love the Lord with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Our minds are to be used in a way that honors and glorifies him. Right. Um, and so we can think of many different ways in which our thoughts are displeasing to the Lord. And so you're right. Yeah. In that sense, we, this also applies to our thoughts as well as our actions. I'm focusing a little bit more on actions just because it makes it a little bit more clear, but you're right. Um, this applies to both. Anything else? Otherwise, I think I might go ahead and close us in prayer. I know it's already about 1035. I want to give people a chance to get to church if they need to do that. Sure. No? Okay. Well, I'll, uh, let's, 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 let me close this out here in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have the opportunity to study it. Um, uh, we thank you that we can, we can learn what it has to teach us. Uh, I thank you that, you know, you're sovereign and you control all things and that there's nothing we need to fear that there's nothing that's going to get in the way of what you've planned and what you've purposed and, and what you'd like to accomplish. Um, and that you've sovereignly controlled and determined all things that uh, we know that one day you'll bring about the new heavens and the new earth that one day we'll spend eternity with you and, and there's nothing, there's nothing to fear that will get in the way there. Um, but we also praise you for the fact that, you know, we, we can, you've given us the freedom to do what we want to do. Um, and, and we pray that we'd use that freedom wisely, that we use it in a way that glorifies and honors you. Uh, and, because we know that ultimately you're going to hold us responsible for what we do. And, and we're going to have to give an account to you and pray that we'd remember that uh, each and every day as, as we go about our lives, that we'd seek to glorify you not only in our actions, and but also in our thoughts and our emotions. Um, pray that uh, as we go forward in our study that you continue to give us clarity of thought as we think through these things and continue to be subservient to what you revealed in your word. 
Um, pray that we glorify you as we go about this week. Uh, thank you for this time and everyone that showed up. Uh, in your name I pray. Amen.